This is lecture 2F, and today we're going to discuss the topic of nuclear chemistry. Nuclear chemistry is really the study of the nucleus of atoms, and the particles found in the nucleus are called nucleons, of which there are two. There are protons and neutrons. The protons are the positive particles found in the nucleus, and the neutrons from the word neutral are the particles that have no charge. For an atom of a particular element, the most important property of that atom is how many protons are in its nucleus, because that's what determines what the element is. The number of protons found in the nucleus of an atom is called it's an atomic number. And each element on the periodic table has an atomic number associated with it. Hydrogen is one, helium is two. That's telling how many protons are in the nucleus of atoms of hydrogen or atoms of helium or any of the 118 elements. Another thing that's gonna become relevant to us throughout this unit is that the atomic number also stands for the charge of the nucleus, because if you have seven protons in the nucleus, the nucleus's charge is positive seven. We'll see how that becomes important later. If you add the number of protons and neutrons that are found in the nucleus of an atom, that number is called the mass number. It's abbreviated by the letter A, and it's the number of nucleons that are in the nucleus, or as I said before, the number of protons plus neutrons. If you have an atom of a particular element and it has a particular number of protons and a particular number of neutrons, we call that a nuclide, an atom with a specific number of protons and neutrons. And the way we represent the composition of a nuclide is something like this. The elemental symbol tells us the element that this atom belongs to, HG stands for mercury. And then in the description, we actually indicate two things, these two terms we've just discussed, atomic number and mass number. In the lower left-hand corner of the elemental symbol, quite often the atomic number is written so that therefore you can have an easy reference as to how many protons there are. Writing the atomic number in the left subscript position is actually optional because if you know the element is mercury, you can look on a periodic table and see that there are 80 protons, so therefore the atomic number is 80, but that's sometimes given as additional information. And then the right, in the rather left superscript position, this is the mass number. So a symbol for a nuclide includes, in the left subscript position, the number of protons in the nucleus, and in the left superscript position, the number of protons plus neutrons. Therefore, the composition of this atom can be determined. The number of protons directly equal the atomic number of 80. The number of neutrons you actually get by subtraction. It would actually be 196 minus 80. So this particular nuclide of mercury must have 116 neutrons in it. If you have a series of nuclides and they all have the same number of protons, we call that group of nuclides isotopes. They're a set of nuclides with the same number of protons. These two nuclides here are both the element mercury, and as you can see, because the subscripts are the same, they're the same element, same atomic number. What's different is the mass number. If the mass number is different but the protons aren't changing, that's because these two nuclides have different number of neutrons. So this is a set of nuclides with the same number of protons, but they have different number of neutrons, and so these are considered isotopes. Now, if you want to name these isotopes, the way an isotope is named is by naming the elemental name, we would say mercury, and then you read the mass number after that. So the first isotope here is called mercury-196. If you want to abbreviate it, you see how it's written there. They can also write HG-196. The second isotope would be verbalized as mercury-198. It could be written HG-198 or written as you see here. Now, chemistry involves chemical reactions, which are how valence electrons of different atoms interact with each other. Nuclear chemistry involves nuclear reactions. These are changes that occur in the nucleus of the atom itself. So this is a significantly different. And when the nucleus undergoes a change, you actually produce different atoms. So nuclear reactions are reactions that produce new atoms. If you actually change the number of protons in the nucleus, you actually turn an atom of one element into an atom of another element. All nuclear reactions don't necessarily do that, but if you do convert an atom of one element into another, that type of nuclear reaction is called a transmutation. When an atom of one element is changed into an atom of another element. Here's an example of a transmutation. If we take 
uh, nuclide of nitrogen, and this isotope or this nuclide's name would be nitrogen-14, and we react it with a helium atom, helium-14 specifically, then what happens is if you shoot these two at each other with a high enough velocity that the nuclei can approach and actually combine together and then interact, so high amounts of energy are needed to do that because of the natural repulsions of the positive nucleus of the nitrogen and the positive nucleus of the helium. But if you can overcome that electrostatic attraction by shooting them at each other hard enough, you can actually cause the nuclei to collide. And if there are change as a taking place, you can create a transmutation. And in fact, when this reaction is uh, produced or occurs, it produces an oxygen 17 atom and a hydrogen one atom. So the nitrogen atom has converted into an oxygen, the helium atom is converted into a hydrogen. This process is actually how all the elements past essentially uranium are created. We have on Earth found elements all the way up to 92 uranium. We actually do have a small amount of element 93 neptunium and a small amount of element 94 plutonium, but not very much. But we can actually create the elements with more than 92 protons in the nucleus by nuclear reactions. So these elements, which we consider artificial elements because they're not found naturally, are made by bombarding large nuclei with smaller ones, much like how nitrogen was being bombarded by the smaller helium atom. So if you take a uranium-238 atom, for example, and you bombard it with hydrogen-2 atoms, if you can overcome the repulsion and cause them to interact, they can actually combine to form a neptunium-238 atom, and then they give off, a little N stands for a neutron, they would give off a pair of neutrons. Now, a couple things about these two reactions we've talked about. First, let me point out that neutron there. See if we understand what we're writing in terms of the superscript and the subscript. The superscript is the, mass, is the mass number. That means protons plus neutrons, and a neutron has one neutron, so that's why it's mass number is one. The, sup, the subscript is the atomic number, which remember also stands for charge, and because a neutron doesn't have a charge, then it would have a mass number, or an atomic number rather of zero. The second thing is I want you to look at each of the reactions and look at the mass numbers. Let's start with the top reaction. On our reactant side, a nitrogen and a helium are reacting. Their mass numbers are 14 and 4. On the product side, the oxygen and hydrogen's mass numbers are 17 and 1. Those are the same. Look at the second reaction. The mass numbers of the reactants are 238 and 2. That adds up to 240. The mass numbers of the products are 238 plus one plus one, because there's two of them, adds up to 240. The mass number is conserved. So the total number of protons plus neutrons in a nuclear reaction cannot change, so mass numbers always have to be conserved. Look at the atomic numbers, or the charges of the nucleus. Top reaction, nitrogen and helium's atomic numbers are seven and two, they add up to nine. Oxygens and hydrogens, eight and one, add up to nine. Atomic numbers are conserved. Look at the second reaction. 92 plus 1 adds up to 93, and in the other product, on the product side, 93 plus 0 plus 0 adds up to 93 as well. So therefore, the number of protons, or the charge that is uh, present in a number of reactants does not change when it turns into the product, so the charge is conserved as well. So you will notice in all nuclear reactions, one, the mass number is always conserved, and two, the atomic number, or the charge, is always conserved. Now, there are 92, 93, 94 naturally occurring elements. So there's atoms of, that have 93 different numbers of protons in their nucleus, 1 to 93 or 94. And then you actually have a number of elements that have protons in their nucleus all the way up to number 118. And each of those elements has a variety of different atoms with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons that each have a number of isotopes. Some of those are stable and some of those are not, and I want to talk about the stable atoms that exist uh, in the, on, from the periodic table. Now, stable nuclides, or we would say stable isotopes as well, those are atoms whose nuclei will last forever. They do not decompose. Most of the atoms in your body are made up of stable nuclides because your atoms are not going to decompose. But there are atoms that are unstable. And those atoms will actually spontaneously decompose into something more stable. And we have a name for those types of nuclides. They aren't stable, they're unstable. 
and we call those radioactive nuclides or sometimes radioisotopes. So these are atoms with nuclei that eventually break down into more stable nuclei. Now, is there any way to tell if a particular isotope of a particular element is going to be stable or radioactive? Well, nuclides are stable when their nuclei have just enough neutrons to minimize proton-proton repulsion that would exist in the nucleus. If you think on the first approximation, should you have an atom that has 20 positive charges really close together in the nucleus, you might go, wow, that's going to cause a lot of repulsion. Maybe big atoms shouldn't exist, their nuclei should fly apart. So the neutrons play a part in that. The neutrons take up space between those protons, allowing the nucleus to exist. And you actually have, have you need to have a certain number of neutrons in there. Not enough neutrons, the proton-proton repulsion will make the nucleus unstable, and it'll be radioactive. Similarly, if you have too many neutrons, you can make the nucleus unstable as well, and it would be radioactive. So we see some trends. If you have really small atoms, atoms that have less than 20 protons in their nucleus, so those would be elements from hydrogen up to calcium. We have found that for each of these elements, their stable isotopes happen to be the ones in which they have a neutron to proton ratio of about one to one. So stable nuclei have a neutron to proton ratio of about one to one for atoms with a low number of protons in the nucleus. If the number of protons increases above 20, the atomic number is greater than 20, then it turns out you need more and more neutrons in the nucleus to buffer the repulsion of that positive charge. So for all the elements on the periodic table whose atomic numbers are greater than 20, the number of neutrons has to be larger. And I can't say specifically what that ratio is uh, unless you get to the really, really big atoms. But as the atomic number increases, stable nuclei have a neutron to proton ratios that continue to increase from one to one, all the way up to the very large atoms that have a ratio of about 1.5 neutrons to protons in order to make that nucleus stable. Now, if we make a graph of every single nuclide that exists, and I'm going to graph protons on the y-axis, and I'm going to graph neutrons on the x-axis, so you have a y-x coordinate of protons and neutrons, or I should say the other way around, an x-y coordinate of neutrons and protons, and you put a little dot on the graph there, that would be a potential nuclide that would exist. And on this graph, all the ones that are colored in black are the ones that are stable. So you can see that the nuclides that are stable follow a specific curve. It's almost a line. It's called the line of stability, but it's really a curve of stability. And on this graph, I've wrote, written in red where the nuclide's composition would be if they have a one-to-one -one neutron to proton ratio. So if you look at the very bottom of the graph, the small atoms, atoms with less than 20 protons, so look at the y-axis, where's 20 protons, okay? Look at all the atoms that are stable, all the black dots that are below 20, they're all really close to that red line. So that means the small atoms, if they're going to be stable, need to have about a one-to-one -one ratio of neutrons to protons. And if I pick one as an example here, let's pick uh, a little one of those black dots that has eight protons in it, and it also has eight neutrons. That's an oxygen atom. So the oxygen 16 atom, eight protons, eight neutrons, gives you a mass number 16. That's where the name comes from. That's stable. Look at its ratio. It's one to one. As you increase the number of protons, as you go up on the graph, you wind up deviating more and more from the one to one ratio. And the reason it's bending to the right is that's telling you you need more neutrons in the nucleus to make that atom stable. Now, if you look at the very end of the line of stability, it ends around 83 protons. So it turns out if you have more than 83 protons in your nucleus, you are not going to be a stable atom. So if we go up there around 80, 81, 82, 83 protons and go, what atoms are stable up here? Here's one. It's uh, 80 protons. It's a mercury atom, and it has 120 neutrons. So what's that ratio? 120 neutrons to 80 protons? That's 1.5 to 1. So at the very end of the line of stability, the atoms that are stable have about a 1.5 to 1 ratio of neutrons to protons. This is all approximate, but essentially true. If you're somewhere in the middle of the line, the ratio of neutrons to protons is somewhere between these two numbers. So um, how do you know what that would be? 
Let's take the element ruthenium, which has an atomic number of 44. That's somewhere right in the middle of the line there. Well, how would you know what isotopes are most likely to be stable for ruthenium? Well, the way you can do that is you can go to the periodic table and you can look up ruthenium's molar mass. If you have a periodic table available, you will see that the molar mass of ruthenium is given as 101.7. What does that mean? It actually has two meanings. It means if you have a mole of ruthenium atoms, you would have to weigh out 101.7 grams to have that mole of ruthenium atoms. So we would say ruthenium's molar mass is 101.7 grams per mole of those atoms. That's a macroscopic meaning of that number at the bottom of ruthenium's block on the periodic table. It's called its molar mass. But that number is also called its atomic mass if you consider it the mass of one ruthenium atom. And if it is one ruthenium atom, it's not how many grams one atom of ruthenium weighs, it's how many AMUs, a really small unit used to measure atomic masses. So that number on the periodic table also tells you that one ruthenium atom has a mass of 101.7 atomic mass units, and at least that's the mass of an average ruthenium atom, because that's what an element's uh, molar mass is. It's really the average molar mass of all the stable isotopes of the element. So on the atomic level, uh, the element's atomic mass is the average atomic mass of all the stable isotopes of the element. Now, <clears throat> if the average mass of a ruthenium atom is 101.7, these masses, these average masses are weighted averages. That means you have to have a lot of isotopes that have masses really close to 101.7 that are common. So because the element's molar mass is a weighted average, the most abundant of the ruthenium isotopes, which means those would be the most stable ones, will have to have molar masses close to it. So the most stable uh, isotopes of ruthenium would have molar masses near 101.7, probably 101 grams per mole or 102 grams per mole. Okay, so how can we use that uh, to our benefit here? Okay, so if you weigh out the mass of a proton or a neutron, this can be done with a mass spectrometer, we know that protons and neutrons have masses of about one atomic mass unit, 1.007827, 1.008665, but they're approximately one. And electrons uh, masses are about 0.000549 AMU, so they're almost zero. What that means is when you have the mass number of an isotope, which is just the sum of the protons and neutrons, What's going to be the mass of that isotope? It's going to be really close to the mass number. So the mass number of an isotope is always almost exactly equal to its molar mass because the protons and neutrons weigh one AMU each and electrons are essentially zero. So let me give you a couple of isotopes ruthenium and let's see if we can predict which one we think would be more likely to be stable. The first one is ruthenium 88. The second one's ruthenium 100. So if these isotopes have mass numbers of 88 and 100 respectively, that means that the atomic mass of those isotopes would be about 88 AMUs per atom and its molar mass would be 88 grams per mole. For ruthenium 100, its atomic mass would be 100 AMUs per atom or about 100 grams per mole. Now, which one's more likely to be the stable one? it's going to be the one that's closer to the average atomic mass of the element ruthenium, which is the 101.7. So because this is closer to the element's actual molar mass, this is more likely to be a stable isotope. Why did I pick the ruthenium 88 as the other possible choice here? Well, that atom has 44 protons and 88 minus 44, 44 neutrons. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. The one-to-one -one ratio only means that Isotopes are likely to be stable if the atomic number is less than 20. So don't use that as a rule for every single element on the periodic table. I'm always looking for ratios of neutrons to protons that are one-to-one. -one. The ratio is one-to-one -one for small atoms. It increases all the way up to 1.5 to 1 for large atoms. But anywhere in between, the most stable isotopes are going to be the one whose mass numbers are as close as possible to the actual molar mass of that element found on the periodic table. Now, <clears throat> on this graph, all the black dots are the stable nuclides. Any combination of protons and neutrons that would graph on this graph here in the white regions, which means to the left or the right of that line of stability, those are isotopes or nuclides that can exist. It's just they're not stable. They're going to be radioactive isotopes. 
and any nuclides that are to the left of the line of stability are unstable because they don't have enough neutrons in their nucleus. We call them neutron poor. If a particular nuclide would be graphed to the right of the line of stability, they're going to be unstable because they have too many neutrons in their nucleus. So nuclides uh, right of the line of stability are unstable because they are neutron rich. Now you remember I said that the line of stability looks like it stops at about atomic number 83. That doesn't look like there's any stable isotopes with more protons than 83. So if you go beyond the uh, line of stability, then those nucleides, nuclides become, become unstable or they become radioactive because they just have too many total protons and the neutrons are just unable to buffer that amount of positive charge in that small vicinity. So these are always gonna be radioactive. Of all the dots that are on the uh, graph here, all the atoms that are stable, that are on the line of stability, there are actually 252 of them. So there's actually only 252 different types of atoms, different types of nuclides that are stable. And of the 252 known stable nuclides, watch this. If we look at how many protons they have and how many neutrons they have, of the 252, 146 of them have an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons. Of the rest, 53 have an even number of protons, 48 have an even number of neutrons, and how many stable nuclides are there that have an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons? There's only five, and those are really small ones like hydrogen two, one proton, one neutron, or lithium six, three protons, three neutrons not very many stable nuclides that have odd numbers of protons and neutrons. This has led nuclear chemists to believe that there's gotta be something special about pairing up nucleons in the nucleus, protons being paired, neutrons being paired. And they actually believe, although we're really, we haven't made a lot of progress in this in the, in the 40 years I was studying nuclear chemistry and actually doing nuclear chemistry research. But we still, we believe that there's a structure to the nucleus. The nucleons are probably arranged in the nucleus, much like electrons are arranged in atoms, probably in shells. And there's something about pairs of protons and neutrons that tends to be stable as well. One bit of evidence for this is that uh, the element tin has the most stable isotopes of any element on the periodic table, has like 11 or 13 stable isotopes. Tin has an atomic number of 50. That's an even number. But we believe that that 50 is what's called a magic number in the nucleus. It's probably very similar to the electron arrangement of a noble gas. It's like a shell is being filled. And there are different numbers that when we get to that number of protons, uh, there tend to be a lot of stable isotopes, and we believe that's much like a magic number or a shell-filling uh, situation as well in the nucleus. But that still has some uh, work to be done. So please notice most of the stable nuclides have either even numbers of protons or neutrons, or most of them actually have even numbers of protons and neutrons. For the radioactive isotopes, because those are unstable, they have to break apart or disintegrate. They undergo what we call nuclear decay. This is the process in which a radioactive nuclide turns into a more stable nuclide. And the type of decay that it undergoes depends upon whether the radioactive nuclide has too many total protons, or if it's neutron rich, or if it's neutron poor. So your ability to distinguish what might be wrong with this nuclide, why it's not stable, is gonna help you determine what type of radioactive decay it undergoes. And one of the first types of radioactive decay people recognized was something called alpha decay. They had like uranium atoms and they were giving off radiation and they actually called it alpha radiation. We now know that alpha radiation is uh, the result of something called alpha decay and it's the release of a helium-4 nucleus, which is a helium atom, two protons, two neutrons, but no electrons, from a radioactive nucleus to become more stable. And these helium-4 nuclei are what we call alpha particles. So when a radioactive uranium atom undergoes alpha decay, it's not giving off electromagnetic radiation per se. Alpha radiation isn't like energy. Alpha radiation is, it means it's giving off a bunch of helium nuclei. And the alphas are emitted from any radioisotopes that are beyond the line of stability. So that means this is the type of decay you see for the atoms that have too many total protons, 
which essentially means atomic number greater than 83, or just another ballpark thing you can use if the mass number is greater than 200, that may be likely as well. So a uranium-238 atom is an example of something that undergoes alpha decay. This atom is unstable because 92 protons is just too many. So one way to get rid of a big chunk of those protons is by to spit out a helium-4 nucleus because it gets rid of two of the protons in the nucleus. And so the protons in the uranium atom will go from 92 down to 90. So where is uranium on here? Why does this one undergo alpha decay? Well, look where the line of stability ends. Uranium has 92 protons. Yikes, that's not even on the graph. That's above the graph. So if you're an atom beyond the line of stability, the type of mode of decay you're probably going to undergo is alpha decay. So what will happen is the uranium atom will spit out a helium nucleus. This can either be written as He42 or because a helium nucleus is called an alpha particle, you can just abbreviate as an alpha. Either of those would be acceptable. Now to figure out what's going to be produced, this is where we use the conservation of atomic number and conservation of mass number. If the uranium atom has a mass number of 238, then the products have to have their mass numbers add up to 238. And if the alpha's mass number is 4, the product nucleus has to be 234. If the atomic number or the charge of uranium nucleus is 92, um, and the alphas is 2, that means the product has to have a nuclear charge of 90. So you're going to produce an atom whose mass number is 234 and atomic number 90. Look on the periodic table. What element is that? Because it's not uranium anymore. That's the element thorium. So the element thorium would be produced when uranium-238 undergoes alpha decay. The way we predicted this, it's the atomic number and the mass number, or I said it the other way around, the mass number and the atomic number are always conserved in uh, nuclear changes. Now, alpha particles are fairly large particles to be spit out of nuclei, which means they don't carry a whole lot of energy with them, and that means they can be stopped by thin sheets of matter. So if you're exposed to alpha radiation, the alpha particles can be stopped by the outermost layers of your skin, which is good, inner organs, and you don't get damaged by alpha radiation. The second type of radiation that people recognized was being given off by radioactive isotopes was something called beta radiation, which is the result of beta minus decay. It's the release of electrons from a radioactive nucleus to become more stable. So beta minus radiation, once again, isn't like electromagnetic radiation. It's actually the release of particles, and the particles that are given off from the nucleus are electrons. If an electron comes from the nucleus, we now tend to write that as the Greek letter beta, but an electron and a beta minus are the exact same thing. Now, who's going to do this? Beta minuses are emitted from radioisotopes that are to the right of the line of stability, which means they have too many neutrons. So if you have too many neutrons, the nucleus is going to spit out an electron. And if you know any chemistry, you go, wait a second, there's no electrons inside of a nucleus. How does that happen? Well, what happens is essentially a neutron in the nucleus decays into a proton which stays in the nucleus and an electron that flies out. So an example of an atom that would undergo beta minus decay is a carbon-14 atom. Why would I predict that? Here's our graph at the line of stability. <clears throat> the element carbon is a low, numbered, uh, low atomic numbered element. Those are the elements that are going to be stable with about a one-to-one -one ratio of protons to neutrons. So carbon-12, for example, would be a very stable carbon isotope. It's one of the black dots down there. Where would you graph carbon-14? It has six protons and eight neutrons. You would graph it over here to the right. So if that element's graph would be to the right of the line of stability, that means it's going to be neutron rich and you have to undergo beta minus decay. So it's going to give off a beta minus particle. Let's look at the subscript and superscript. Remember for mass numbers, mass numbers are assigned a value of one for protons and one for neutrons and that's because they have masses of about one AMU each. An electron has a mass of about zero AMUs so it's assigned a mass number of zero. What's the subscript? That's the atomic number or the charge. What's the charge of an electron? It's negative one. So that's why in the subscript position, we have a negative one written. For you to predict the product nucleus, we have to conserve the mass numbers and the atomic numbers. So the mass number for our product has to be 14 because zero plus 14 will equal the 14 from the carbon 14. 
what does the atomic number of the product have to be? That has to be seven because if the carbon starting with six positive charges and we're producing a negative charge, we have to have seven positives so that negative one and seven would add up to six. The element with seven positives in the nucleus, seven protons, that's nitrogen. So the carbon 14 atom is turning into a nitrogen 14 atom. The beta minus particles that are being given off are way lighter than helium nuclei. That means they're more energetic and they're more penetrating. And if you're exposed to a radioactive source that's giving off beta particles, they can actually penetrate about one centimeter into uh, the body of a living organism. The next type of radioactive decay we're going to discuss is something called electron capture. It's abbreviated EC. And that's when an orbiting electron in an atom gets sucked in and is captured by the nucleus to become more stable. Electron capture occurs in radioisotopes to the left of the line of stability, those that are neutron poor. Why does this happen? Because when an electron gets sucked into the nucleus, can you imagine what the nucleus is doing with that electron? It's gonna combine it with a proton. If an electron and a proton combine together, their charges cancel out, they turn into a neutron. So essentially, this is an electron and a proton turning into a neutron. An example of an atom that would undergo electron capture would be beryllium-7, and the reason for that is, if you think about where beryllium-7 would be graphed on this graph here, it's actually located over here to the left side of the line of stability. The small atoms have uh, stable atoms that are about one-to-one -one ratios of protons to neutrons, so beryllium atoms with four protons and four neutrons would probably be stable. So if you have four protons and only three neutrons, you're a neutron poor, you'd be graphed to the left of the diagonal line. That's where you're gonna undergo electron capture. Electron capture is the only type of radioactive decay in which you're adding something to the reactant, so it sucks in an electron. When the electron comes from the shells, it's usually written E minus. If it's emitted from the nucleus, that's when it's written as a beta minus, but they're actually identical particles. And once again, the mass number of an electron is zero and its charge is negative one. That describes its superscript and subscript. So what's the product gonna be? Its mass number would have to be seven because it has to equal seven plus zero. And its atomic number has to be three because it has to equal four plus negative one. And an atom with three protons in its nucleus would be lithium. So that means that the beryllium seven atom gets turned into a lithium seven atom. The next type of radioactive decay is something called positron decay. Positron is abbreviated by a beta with a plus sign. And this is the release of an electron with a positive charge from a nucleus to become more stable. Have you ever heard of a positron before? What is that? A positron is just like an electron, but instead of a positive charge, it has a negative charge. We call that a particle of antimatter. Electrons as well as protons and neutrons, are all particles of matter. They make up everything in our world, our solar system, our galaxy, our universe. But a positron is a particle of antimatter. Where have you heard that before? Didn't they have antimatter in that Star Wars movie? They had the Death Star, and that Death Star, didn't it shoot an antimatter beam in a planet? And then I don't know what happened. The, the planet blew up, didn't it? Why, why would that be? Well, that's because when a positron, which is antimatter, and a electron, which are, is matter, they meet. Matter and antimatter annihilate each other. They are annihilated, meaning all of their mass gets converted into energy. So in Star Wars, when they shot that beam of antimatter at that planet and the antimatter interacted with the planet's matter, then the planet blew up and it disappeared and it turned completely into energy. So that really isn't a whole bunch of hocus pocus. That actually is based upon science. We do have antimatter particles can be created. They're created in positron decay. The positron will fly out. It'll eventually hit some particle of matter and then annihilate into energy, but it does exist. And in fact, if a positron and electron annihilate each other, all of their mass gets converted into energy and that energy is released as photons of electromagnetic radiation. So if you have an electron and a positron interacting with each other, if they, if they touch, then they get, have all their mass converted completely into two little photons of energy. So that's what matter and antimatter do. And positron decay is a way in which antimatter is created in our universe. So 
beta positives are emitted from radioisotopes that are to the left of the line of stability, those that are neutron poor. We already just saw a type of decay that occurs for these types of atoms, that's electron capture. So anything to the left side of the line of stability actually has two potential modes of radioactive decay they could undergo, either electron capture or positron decay. It's not clear as to why one might happen over the other, but they essentially are both possible. What's happening here is a proton in the nucleus decays into a neutron, which seems strange. So what it does is it gives off an antimatter electron, and that's the nuclear change that occurs when you have positron decay. So an atom that may undergo positron decay has to be something that's uh, neutron poor. Carbon atoms are small. That's when the neutron to proton ratio is one to one for the stable atoms. So if you have six protons, you would imagine six neutrons would make the carbon atom stable. That would be carbon 12. This has to be uh, neutron poor because it doesn't quite have the 12 mass number needed to make it stable. If you were to graph the position of carbon 11 on our graph of protons and neutrons, it would be to the left of the diagonal line or left of the line of stability. So it's got to be unstable because it's neutron poor. So if it's going to give off a, a positron, let's think about the symbol of a positron. It has um, no mass, just like an electron, so, or very low mass like an electron, so it's mass number zero. But it does have a positive one charge, so the subscript is plus one. If you want to predict the, the product nucleus then, the mass number has to be 11, so that zero plus 11 equals 11. And the atomic number has to be five, so that five plus one equals six and atoms with five protons in the nucleus are called boron atoms. So the carbon 11 is gonna decay into a boron 11 atom by positron emission. Now, all four of these types of radioactive decay, when they occur, they actually also give off energy, electromagnetic radiation energy, and it's usually photons of electromagnetic radiation in the gamma range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So gamma decay, is the release of any high energy photons of electromagnetic radiation, and these are always given off along with all of the other types of radioactive decay we've discussed. So gamma rays are emitted along with other forms of decay, or sometimes if you just happen to have an excited nucleus to emit some of its energy to become stable, it'll just emit a gamma ray on its own. If we have an example of potassium-40 undergoing beta minus decay to turn into a calcium-40 atom, when the new calcium-40 atom is created, the nucleons rearrange themselves to become more stable and they spit out a little bit of energy and that's a gamma ray. Now a gamma ray is a form of electromagnetic radiation. It has no mass, it has no charge. So if you're gonna write that in your nuclear equation, it would have a mass number of zero and an atomic number or a charge of zero as well. So these are always given off and quite often you have several gamma rays given off with any particular type of uh, nuclear decay. If you happen to have a nucleus that is unstable and it's an excited state, you'll see that because the mass number will have an M written after it. This is 163M. That means this atom is in a meta-stable state. It's not its stable state, it's a little bit higher energy. So that will become a more stable atom. It'll turn into 16367 by giving off a gamma ray, releasing that energy, and the atom becomes stable. Now, because gamma rays are given off in every type of nuclear decay, gamma rays, you have to take into account their uh, penetratability and their dangers. And gamma rays are actually deeply penetrating, even more so than x-rays, because gamma rays have higher energies than x-rays, and you don't want to sit in front of the, you know, the dentist for a long time, right? So you don't want to have gamma rays exposing on you for a long enough amount of time. because So they're very damaging to living organisms. And because they're released in all types of radioactive decay, then you have to take that into account. There's actually really no radioactive material that you want to be exposed to in large amounts. So just reviewing the three types of radioactive decay particles we've talked about, you can give off alpha particles, either beta plus or beta minus particles, or you can give off gamma radiation. The alpha particles, because they're low in energy, they get absorbed by either just a piece of paper or the outer layer of your skin. So if you have a, an alpha source in front of you, holding up a piece of paper will block all the alpha particles. Beta particles are more penetrating than that. They're going to actually go through paper. 
But if you have a piece of plastic, like a plastic clipboard or something, you can actually hold that up in front of you and that would absorb the beta minus or beta plus particles protecting you. But the gamma radiation, because it's high energy electromagnetic radiation, penetrates through paper, through plastic, and you either need concrete blocks or uh, shields made of lead in order to stop those. The last type of decay I want to talk about is something that happens with a really large nuclei. It's called spontaneous fission. And spontaneous fission is when a large nucleus, and it has to have an atomic number bigger than 80, just breaks into two approximately equal halves. It's like if you have like a whole bunch of chocolate chip cookies, you can break all the chocolate chip cookies in half. Are they always going to be exactly the same? No, it's kind of random. So when spontaneous fission occurs, you break a large nucleus into two approximately equal halves, but every type, time an atom undergoes fissions, the products are slightly different. And what else happens when you break cookies in half? You get crumbs. Well, that happens under spontaneous fission as well. So whenever atoms undergo spontaneous fission, they release crumbs, several neutrons, and they release a whole lot of energy as well. And we're going to see this in our next lecture when we're talking about potential uses for atoms that undergo spontaneous fission. So uranium-239 atom is an example of something that undergoes spontaneous fission. So when it does, the uranium atom on its own, because it's unstable, just breaks into two approximately equal halves. So if the uh, atomic number of uranium is 92, that means you might get two uh, products that are produced that have atomic numbers of 46 and 46, or maybe 45 and 47, or maybe 44 and 48. It's different every single time, but to write a proper balanced nuclear equation, you would want to make sure that the atomic numbers are conserved. And so if the uranium is 92, the two products here have their atomic numbers added to 92 as well. The mass number will approximately break in half as well, but it's not going to quite equal the mass number. Notice what I've written. I've written 116 and 120. What does that add up to? That adds up to 236. It's never going to add up to 239 because of the crumbs. So you have to include some crumbs here. And if I have my mass numbers adding up to 236, that means I'm going to write a reaction that has three neutrons produced because three neutrons would give me three more mass numbers and therefore the 239 and 239 would be equivalent. Now, is this what always happens? Absolutely not. I just made up one possible scenario for a uranium-239 atom to undergo spontaneous fission. You might do something different. You might make it go 46 and 46 or maybe 45 and 47. And as long as you have the atomic numbers adding up to 92, then at least you're balancing the atomic numbers. And then you just have to make sure that your mass numbers are balanced as well. I've made 118 and 119, which adds up to 237. The deficit is telling you how many neutrons would be produced, and that would be two. So these are actually both uh, perfectly acceptable examples of spontaneous fission reactions. The only thing you want to steer clear of is when spontaneous fission occurs, you get one, two, three, four, five neutrons, something like that. Don't ever have a reaction that produces 27 neutrons because that never happens, okay? And the reason it doesn't is that the products you get are always very neutron rich. These two products we have here, they're called daughter products. They're way above the stable ratio of neutrons to protons for the particular elements we've had. And because they have such high amount of neutrons to protons compared to the stable ratio, they're going to be very radioactive. So these daughter products from spontaneous fission events are very radioactive, and they're always different from each other. But if you were to make 25 or 30 neutrons be released from the spontaneous fission, then the two atoms you would have created would be very close to their stable neutron to proton ratio, and they would not be radioactive. And that's not what we see uh, in real life when we are determining what the products are for these reactions.